Good morning. There's not a lot of good about it, is there? What's wrong with it? I got two degrees, it's pissing with rain, and we're going for a bike ride. Well, we could go for something that resembles a bike ride. Shit, this is. Why have you come back? Welcome back to Bike Fit Tuesdays. Yay! Hi, viewers. <laughs> uh, so, we're going to ride that way because it's raining. We're going to ride that way. Um, there might be less rain. There might be. There won't be. It's going to get worse. At least it's not snowing. Could be worse. Uh, it's not snowing. It's uh, not there, snowing. There, could be, there could be tons of things going wrong worse than this right now. I have no gears again. Okay. That means we can ride slow and... Yeah, well, we always ride slow with me, don't we? <laughs> Big right. fat bearded bloke. Let's go, camera's going away. Oh. You ready? Not really, no. Why not? What we're we talking about again? How do you become a bike fitter? Two, what happens when you put the front end of your bike too low? Too long or too low. So I've started noticing this. Um, I guess I, I've, I've learned through using, it's great how when you use technology, you start learning new things and seeing new things. Um, I guess I had a guy in the other day who's, uh, who's a Katsu racer, he's got good position, saddle's all right, you know, it's good height and all of this kind of stuff. But we were playing around with front end height and reach and seeing what effect it had on the saddle. And actually I've had a couple of races recently whereby they've got, you know, the, the obligatory 130mm stem on their saddle and it's, there's no stem space. on their saddle? Stems. Mate, that's weird. You're gonna have to cut that out. That'd be really painful. They've got the obligatory 130mm stem with no spaces under it. On their handlebars. On their handlebars. And, but, you know, it, when, when you apply that to a jig and then you, Bring the front end up and while well, pressure mapping in the saddle, it's amazing what happens at the saddle in terms of dramatic reduction in pressure through the nose of it, the pelvis starts to stabilise, pressure reduces, it becomes more balanced and, uh, and more often than not actually things like heart rate go down, uh, cadence goes up, power improves, sustainability improves. So it's sort of... Uh, uh, People have, uh, I've had people emailing me and sending me Instagram posts of, oh, you know, what do you think of this, of these really extreme positions? And I mean, let's just put it, get it out straight away. I'm not opposed to aggressive positions. I'm really not. I'm not opposed to people slamming the stems. I'm not opposed to long stems. If they can deal with it. I'm opposed to people doing it for no good reason whatsoever, just because of, you know, because of... Fashion. Just to make it look good. Yeah. Which, or because of a trend, which is just the case more often than not and uh, you know you get all these people who say they're pretty serious cyclists yet they're, they're doing these things to their positions just for fashion. But there's also a correlation between excessive reach and lower back pain as well. You know, quite a lot of people will end up with lower back pain. Uh, but going back to the pelvic thing you know I've, I've had people who have been experiencing knee pain as a result of the reach being too long. You know, so there's, there's, there's quite a lot of issues with having an excessive reach and uh so sort yeah. of if you're trying to diagnose a problem raising the front end is a good place to start to try and eradicate it hmm. bearing in mind that <clears throat> you know, most most of these people are just completely folding themselves in half it's a lot of the time they don't even ride that much either so they, they don't even have time to to adapt to the thing and a lot of them are, are using professional positions as a uh, as a basis for, for setting up their own bike, which straight away is just a really bad idea, uh, based on the fact that professionals are, you know, they're not the same as us, they're, they're almost contortionists, um, they're, they're more functional than we are, they're stronger than we are, they ride more than we do, so, you know, having, having a guy that sits at a desk all day, having a slammed front end, 130 mil stem on his bike, just isn't gonna work, it's not gonna work at all. You are right? Yeah, man. Oh, Lawrence. It's a cool dog. <laughs> How do you become a bike fitter if you want to become a bike fitter? I sort of fell into it by accident. Um, I mean, the, so the IBFI, if, you, if you're looking to become a bike fitter, the IBFI website, which I think we've referenced in lots of videos. International uh, Bike uh, Fitter. In, International Bike Fitting Institute. Um, they... 
they have a, a a page that will give you basically all the courses that you need. I think my advice to anyone looking to get into bike fitting is do as many of those courses as you can uh, and embrace this broader an understanding of, of different bike fitters opinions on how people should be placed on bikes mm. uh, I think most big American bike manufacturers now have their own bike fitting solution uh, their own system which in isolation is it's probably okay but it, it, it's probably not as effective as if you if you drew in inspiration from three or four of them it's three or four points of view because I mean, you, what you need to understand about a systematized approach in bike fitting is one essentially it's one person's opinion of how to set people up on a bike and if, fundamentally they're all kind of the same thing they're all kind of cookie cutter leg extension knee over pedal axle the, the, the heavily uh, driven by by looking at angles and numbers and it's, it's fairly it's very basic and simplistic but you use that as a basis to uh, to basically just start positioning people on bikes I, my advice to most people is to avoid looking too much at the numbers and start looking at people look at people how, how people move on a bike look at how they're interacting with it I mean I, I guess you you get this from be from, from experience I mean, I've done a few thousand fits now so you uh, you start to notice things you start to notice like people rolling the wrists in because the bars are too wide or pointing toes because the saddle's too high or whatever it might be and I think it's <coughs> it's quite dangerous to just be completely focused on, on just tooling and numbers and, uh, and and systems but Tony Cork actually Tony Cork's a great educator he's a very good bike, ed bike fit educator uh, and he he sort of teaches a lot of people how to really interact with 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 their cyclists, with their with their clients, uh, rather than just uh, rather than just adhering to numbers and rule of thumb. So actually, if you're looking to get into bike fitting, I'd give Tony Cork a shout. That's uh, Talk Talk Systems, I think his his company's called, uh, and he'll give you a very pragmatic point of view. On on uh, on how to set people up on bikes. So yeah, there you have it. Go out, do some fitting. If you want some help from me, drop me a line. I'm always always happy to help with education and any of that sort of stuff. Uh, so so yeah. <laughs> so you're in that side. Been a good ride. Yeah. We got far, didn't we? Look at how cold it is. You're already cold. God, it's freezing. <laughs> Take me back to South Africa. Yeah, amen to that. <laughs> I've had a delivery because I've been doing quite a lot of traveling recently. The guys at Cycon have very kindly sent me a new bike back. So I can now travel around without worrying too much about snapping my bike in off. It's nice to be back doing episodes of Bike Fit Tuesdays again, despite the horrendous weather. It always ends up warmer and dry later in the day after the ride is done. Surely I've been back long enough from South Africa to climatise now? I don't know. In any case, I'll do my best to ride tomorrow. See you then.